for the systems again, and here are some of the explanations of why we did what we did. Again, Section 2A is the existence of, you know, we got the original prohibition zone established, and then due to these complications with the ge geology here and the different depths of contamination, it, <coughs> um, you know, it's, well, it was just something we felt um, was not unreasonable if we had the adequate monitoring plan. So we did get additional monitoring. We have a contingency plan, which if any of these perimeter wells along the north edge of the prohibition zone expansion and the original get 20 parts per billion, uh, then the company is going to have to do an investigation to find out is is that contamination really migrating to the northeast? And, and if it turns out that it's that that's what it appears, then they're going to have to do another feasibility study to determine what to do with that uh, contamination and how to address it. And the parties have agreed in this amendment that we do not want to expand. I mean, even they agree. We don't want to expand this any further. They're, we want them to address anything if, and we, again, we think it's growing east. But the problem is you have to monitor and watch it for you know, years and years and years to be sure. And so that's the long-term monitoring that's going to go on in this site. And um, let's see. Um, so we are keeping the bark pond in mind, and we do have a better monitoring plan, as well as contingency. Okay, uh, the core system we talked about, I think, we're getting additional investigation and improved monitoring, which is still in the process of being determined once they're done. With, there's one more well they're going to install um, starting next week, I believe. And if, okay, and I don't have the Western Plume up here again, but, but we have a provision in there that if the Western Area Plume expands, they have to pull it back. That, is, that language is in the amended consent judgment, and there are specific penalties referenced. They acknowledge, and you know, we are going to, again, we have to go to court to get penalties assessed, but it is our intention. So it's going to be like the Evergreen penalty, huh? Yes, I know. I knew that was the, yeah. Okay. Um, the Western area, they've agreed to continue the remediation. Um, until it's fully cleaned up or they'll get the restrictions. So initially they were going to totally ignore that. And then uh, on the Unity Plume, uh, previously they had to, uh, according to the Unity order that was issued by the judge in two, December 2004, um, they have now two extraction wells in this, where am I? <laughs> um, in this stretch. Okay, the new one is up in here. Uh, they previously had to stop contamination above 85 parts per billion from migrating east into the prohibition zone to the extent practical. Now the company didn't really like that because they said, well, if it's in the prohibition zone, nobody's drinking the water, why should we have to worry about it? Well, one of the complications is this is all wetland here, and it's pretty hard to, to put in monitoring wells in those wetlands. And although they were capturing quite a bit, you know, there were indications that there were 85, something above 85 parts per billion continuing to get what to the east. So instead of that, we now have a, a 200 gallon per minute minimum purge well, purge rate from those two extraction wells on Wagon Road. Um, again, with termination, termination subject to DEQ approval to prevent my grad prevent migration of mass in the eastern area. So 200 uh, gallons a minute was about what it was at Evergreen before they said they... That's true, and they yeah. have been actually purging about 200. That's about what they have been doing. Yeah. Uh, so that worked out well. And there was another point. Back at the Evergreen system, they are actually, they have extraction wells there. They're going to continue operating those at a somewhat reduced rate, and I want to get into the... Um, road part in the second year. But again, they have to continue operating those extraction wells at a minimum of 100 gallons per minute 
uh, until they get our approval to be able to stop doing that. But we want them to keep doing that. And then the other thing, but, um, let's see, Mitch, if you can go back to the plumes, I wanted to point out um, that one. Yes, that's good. Okay, so here's the Maple Village Shopping Center. There's uh, an extraction well here and then two injection wells. And then here we have Vets Park, Section Park, where there's a number of monitoring wells. This is where, oh, I thought it was done. Uh, this is where they have to stop 2,800 part, parts per billion from migrating east of Maple Road. That criterion we call the groundwater surface water interface, which is the number that is deemed to be safe for uh, venting into surface water, um, safe for humans as well as for, for the environment, for the organisms that live in the, in the riverbed and that kind of thing. Um, so we're applying that standard here at Maple Road as opposed to uh, over here in River where we think that it's going to get uh, eventually migrate to. And but they've in effect dragged that back to Wagner Road. Well, this actually there is no there is no limit at Wagner Road. This is true. But um, the, the just a little bit about the concentrations in this plume here. We know there's concentrations up to about three thousand parts per billion. But at this location so far. Um, there have been some um, some wells detections of about 2,000 parts per billion, um, but on the other side of Maple Road, so far, currently about 800 parts per billion is the highest, although it's been as high as about 1,300 parts per billion. So we don't expect that 2,800 or even close to 2,800, hopefully, is going to get east of Maple Road. And then the company has to continue tracking the migration of the plume as it moves, whichever way it moves. And when it gets to the river, um, yeah, uh, when it gets to the river, they're going to have to verify is it is it actually venting or discharging into the groundwater, into the surface water, which is what typically happens, or is it possibly going further east? In which case, that's going to have to be addressed or is it going to be potentially migrating along the bed of the river, which could carry it to other places. So it's, there's going to be a lot of monitoring going on. The other change, and I'm going to quit here, um, is, okay, so this is a close-up of the Maple Village Shopping Center in Best Park, and this is their extraction well. Um, currently, they have a little treatment, mobile treatment unit, they call it right here. Um, they, pump, they pump up only right now 50 gallons per minute at this location. They've been sending it over here for treatment and then they bring it back and they have two injection wells, one up here and one up here, and they re-inject it into the ground at, um, so this, it's already contaminated here. Um, they have to treat that water to below 85 parts per billion and they re-inject it. Although they stopped doing that in January, which is what they really want to do is to put in this pipeline, this pink is, doesn't exist. That's where they want to put in a pipeline. The blue is already existing pipeline um, from their major extraction wells right here, like with LD1 and 3. And um, so if they make this connection, because these three injection wells uh, are plagued with biofouling and mineral buildup, and they have to periodically put down acids and wash out the screens and it's it's very problematical um, the injection always has been so they want to take this 50 gallons per minute or maybe up to 100 gallons per minute and put it in this pipeline which they have a bigger pipeline that goes back to their plant uh, for treatment so that's part of their proposal um, to give them more options to this part of the, the, the contaminated groundwater so I think um, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Mitch. Okay, this is the last slide, then we'll open it up for questions for everyone. To summarize, we've got a new legally enforceable agreement. Um, 
We think that the, on balance, the consent judgment amendments have made for a more implementable remedy, albeit with different endpoints, um, that will result in steady progress toward the goals or endpoints, with a lot less bickering about things that we've been fighting with the company with uh, or about over the past number of years in terms of number of monitoring wells necessary, et cetera. Um, there, the agreement includes financial insurance mechanism so that if uh, Paul has financial problems, there's a mechanism in place to cover their remedial obligations going forward or to continue to do oversight and go to court if and when necessary to enforce the agreement. Um, the downgrading investigation civil already mentioned, and I think Vince or somebody asked a question about whether we're going to continue to do ongoing monitoring, and, and there's going to need to be uh, years of monitoring as the plume continues to migrate toward the river and see if, in fact, it discharges to the river or does something surprising. And um, as I mentioned earlier, civil and me and our Successors of the DEQ, assuming there is going to be continue to, there continues to be a DEQ moving forward, are going to be working with Paul and his successors going forward for years to come because of the nature of this type of remedy. So with that, I'm going to start with questions, and there's a gentleman that's been patient in the back with a blue shirt, so go ahead, sir. Yeah, you made the comment that they were responsible for testing the wells on the north side of the Prohibition Zone uh, by Barton Pond and moving towards the Huron River. Are you saying that Paul is responsible for testing to see if it became from moving that way? Is, is that what? The minor wells at uh, Civil Engineer? Yeah. Yes, um, those are Paul. So, so the, the, the people who are responsible for contaminants are responsible for seeing if they move towards the Huron River and Yeah, with the yeah. department's oversight and. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Question was why is the company that's responsible for contamination also able to do? the monitoring, and number one, because it's their responsibility, but they're doing so with the department's oversight, and we do occasionally obtain what we call split samples, where we'll take samples from the same well, send them to the DEQ lab and compare our results, and in the past, those results have matched up very favorably, very similarly. Okay, okay where do we want to start? Uh, you can start over here. Uh, I read something recently about uh, Paul hiding the results of a certain monitoring well uh, for the uh, Can you expound on it? Question is, the uh, gentleman read something recently about Paul hiding the results of a certain monitoring well. I haven't read it. MW30, I believe. MW30, oh, that's, that's, all, that's, uh, that's a historical well. I think it's... 30, well... Is there somebody who can run a camera? Because I have to go up front now. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, because I, I have to commandeer one of the screens okay. and bring I think what bring you guys up to the 21st century. It, what, what, what it's referenced is the fact that MW30, as the gentleman mentioned, is a, a deeper unit E well, and it turns out. We don't have any evidence to think to believe that Paul has been hiding any any monitor well results. Sense, you mean? You don't have any evidence to prove that they're, that they're hiding, hiding further. Well okay, since that incident. I'm not even saying that they hit it. I don't think we, we think they did anything. We've had all the results all along. Next question. Actually, they have. Uh, Sam? I watched, I was looking at the map back here. It shows a yellow area, which is outside of your main plumes. And it was a little west, then a little north, and it went up and down. Is that still moving? OK, the question is, uh, some of the figures back here show a larger extent of contamination, a yellower area that's larger than the plumes that we put on our maps. And I think the reason for that is, if, if I know which maps you're referring to, it's part of the maps that either the county or um, the Sci Residence for Safe Water put together. And that 
shows the extent of contamination approximately out to a concentration of one part per billion. Whereas the plumes that we've got up here are the extent of the concentrations up to 85 parts per billion. Now the state can only enforce a cleanup criterion of the state that's promulgated under state law and that's 85 parts per billion. I'd be concerned if it was even one part per billion, but why is it going up and down? And does that indicate that it may move further north? I live further north and not very far further okay. north. The question is why is it going up and down and there's a concern about the possibility of the contamination migrating further to the north. north. I didn't, I wasn't, I was filling around, I'm not sure which area you're talking about or which well. Well, I think, suffice it to say that uh, we, again, we can only require the company to delineate the extent of contamination as defined by state law. Earlier I did, we did mention the concern that we have based on the EPA's change in toxicology that the um, state cleanup criterion might go down lower. So we share your concern. We think if it does go down substantially, uh, we're going to have to engage further with the company and at least have them identify the extent of contamination out to the newer standard if one is promulgated. How do I check where the plume is moving? How do you check? The question is how do you, how does uh, someone check where the plume is moving? And if you're talking about the plume less than 85, um, we don't really have, the, the state doesn't have the ability to require Paul to address that right now. If you have a well, and there are some wells that Sybil can summarize for you, further west of uh, Wagner Road, residential wells that we have by. I'm, I'm on Wagner Road, and just about a quarter of a mile north of Dexter Road, so I'm very concerned with the yellow plume, even though it may be only one part per billion. Okay, she's talking about an area on Wagner Road, just north of Dexter Road. Well, that's Concentration 
allowed under law decreases, that additional work is going to be necessary to uh, determine whether the existing <coughs> remedy is protected or not. We have every intention of following through if the state law changes to that effect. This is gentleman in the front row, please. Can I can I interject? <coughs> you? you said 85 parts. This is the plume map at 100 parts per billion in 1992. This is the plume map now at 85 parts per billion. <coughs> but again, it's a two-dimensional map. To really get an idea of how much dioxin is down there, you extrude that up to the various levels, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 parts per billion. This gives you a better idea of how much dioxin there is. Well, it's dioxane, not dioxin. I said and, dioxane. And again, we're, we're not disputing the fact that they're allowed under the current law to leave mass in place. Gentlemen, the front row. It appears to me you have a very small staff and we'll try concerned about is eco-terrorism. So all these wells, how secure are they? The question is uh, concern about the number of staff and security from a terrorism you know, monitor Each time they go to a well to see what they're doing, you just assume they're doing their work properly, right? Oh, well, the the question is about oversight. Are we oh. it's secure. Are, are the wells secure 24 7? The well, the wells have locks on them. Many of them are what you call flush mounted, so they're even with the gray the ones that are above that protect the cast. Ma'am? I'm going to make an editorial comment and then a very short question. First of all, thank you very much, Roger. I think this year, um, in May, we should gather on Lakewood Playground and celebrate 25 years of dealing with this. My son was six. He's 31 now. After 10 years, I couldn't be angry anymore, and I couldn't do this anymore. So thank you very much, Roger, for being the watchdog. Now, my question is, both as a resident and as a taxpayer, why should we be happy about this particular consent judgment? No. I, I just can't I just can't be angry anymore. It's it's like did everybody hear the question? You need to get, why should, as a taxpayer and a citizen, why should we be hey, happy? We're, we're paying you guys to spend okay. millions of dollars. I mean, well, I'm sure you're all. You're I don't think you should be happy about it, personally. Uh, as, from a department standpoint, we're tasked with responding to proposals, in this case, from liable parties and under state law. If they, they submit something that complies with the law, we have to approve it. That's what I was showing you with Section 2A. Uh, should you be happy about it? If I were you, I don't think that would be. Um, and in terms of the job Civil in particular is doing, and, and hopefully me, uh, we are involved in, in providing oversight. I think we got the best deal we could under the circumstances, all things considered, and those all things include the lengthy legal history that you mentioned, uh, I mean, the yeah, history. We're going to be definitely great before, and it's still good. Right. I, I, I'm not trying to sell you a bill of goods and say this is going to get cleaned up. I mean, the court made its ruling, and uh, it's, it's compliant with state law, and, and I'm not going to try and sugarcoat it. I mean, why should you be happy? I'm not saying you should be. Next, uh, Vince. I have three main concerns. One, I, I read in a publication that the EPA probably will lower the standard um, as it was told to a municipal employee in, in uh, Arizona, that EPA will probably lower the standard to below the three parts per billion. It may be like 1.5 parts per billion. Okay, can um, we deal with them one at a time so I can paraphrase for you? Is that a question yet or not? Well, I, I, um, I'm, I have a concern about that, that um, EPA in a federal standing will set a standard that is actually similar to most other communities in the country. Our standard is really high when you look across the United States. And why that is, I don't know. I could conjecture why we have an 85 part per billion standard, but it would just be conjecture. I think all these other states are down at three, five, and six. And we have this humongous standard that makes no sense. Okay, EPA, the first, the EPA first. is probably going to lower the standard from what I've read in uh, uh, written publications uh, newspapers. Well, the, the first question comment is uh, 
is the EPA likely to lower the standard for 1,4-dioxane to something as low as 1.5 parts per billion? And other states have, have lower standards too. First point is EPA doesn't currently have a, a maximum contaminant level for 1,4-dioxane. Other states do have, I think they might have contaminant levels. Uh, Michigan uh, has this 85 part per billion cleanup criterion and it's based on our 1 in 100,000 increased cancer risk value uh, that's part of the law and it's, uh, it's based on the toxicology for uh, that it, we use EPA's toxicology and that's why I, we mentioned earlier that EPA's recent change to the IRIS database which is their toxicology database may result in the Michigan lowering of a cleanup criteria. I just want if, to point out. If, I, I need to point out first that if under state law there is a provision that if a maximum contaminant level does get promulgated by the feds, that does become the state's drinking water standard and therefore the cleanup criteria. So if for speculating, you know, we don't know what EPA is going to do and, and we've heard, you know, we've been following it too and it could take a number of years for them to promulgate a cleanup criteria or a maximum contaminant level. If that happens, uh, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have to go through a rule promulgation process at that point because the statute says if there's an MCL, that becomes the cleanup criteria. And again, we'd be in the same boat, I think, that we were talking about earlier, of evaluating protectiveness of existing remedy in light of the new standard. Okay, so that was one of three. What's the next one? The other one was uh, in the card group, and I'm glad you guys are involved in that and, and, and come to the meetings and such. But one of the things we've discussed and have been brought to the meeting was that there are uh, competing analyses of the geological um, distribution of the water in this area. There are a preliminary study that shows some flows moving to the north for Spartan Pond as well as some flows moving to um, the river in a bifurcated fashion. Um, that was done at MSU and would lead us to believe that there may be a strong potential for this flow to move towards Spartan Pond which I think everyone has agreed that that would be a very serious and uh, uh, problematic you know, turn of events. And if this flow moves too far, it may be impossible to capture it from going into Barton Pond. And that's a real concern that's been discussed. The other concern I'll just mention is that um, as part of the watershed group, I also have a concern about this flu moving through the city and getting into people's basements through groundwater contamination. And that has really not been looked at, even though we've made that comment many times before, um, as it moves towards the river, it will come closer to the surface. And what contamination of uh, groundwater in people's basements, you know, what effect will that have on, how, on homes? So we want to paraphrase around these. OK, first comment slash question is, there's been some competing views of the groundwater flow direction, and therefore the probable uh, groundwater contamination plumes fate, some of which indicate, uh, Vince cited one, some work done by MSU indicating a flow off to the north or northeast toward Barton Pond. We know that the, uh, the city had done, had hired a consultant to do some studies. The DEQ has looked at um, our own analysis of Paul's data and um, interestingly, um, the city's consultant basically concluded that the flow was likely to be more toward the east than the northeast. The DEQ said we had some concerns about Paul's data indicating that it was more easterly than northeasterly. We did require them to put in some more wells and we've since got additional wells. And I, you know, we still have a concern that that's a possibility, which is why we structured the monitoring plan that we came up with the way we did. We came up with um, strategically placed wells to supplement existing wells and, and for those of you that don't know it, the way we identify the shape and extent of groundwater plumes are through a series of wells and um, we look at both the water levels in those wells and the, the chemical data from them to infer generalized flow directions and Dr. Lemke would be the guy, if I don't say this he's probably going to give me some so a hard time afterward. Uh, it's a generalized thing. We're making inferences based on the data. So the fact that we move this prohibition zone to the north directly towards the pond is not reassuring to me. 
Vince is saying that the fact that we moved the, the prohibition zone further to the north is not reassuring to him. And uh, I appreciate that concern. We looked at, as I said, multiple studies out there and um, concluded that those studies in combination with the additional monitoring network and the triggers that we put in place are going to be protective. And we got the contingency plan in place for additional feasibility study and additional work in the event surprises occur. And then you also had a thing about uh, migration into people's basements. Um, I think we'll cross that bridge when and if we come to it because we don't uh, we don't have evidence to believe that's the case right now. As a continue, you know, I think as we mentioned earlier, there's going to be continued migration easterly at least. And uh, if it turns out to, it's very deep right now below ground surface. Probably what 200 feet deep in the vicinity of Maple Road, Sybil? Well, it's, there's shallower than that. I mean, 100 plus. Well, it won't come up towards the river. As the, the topography, so yes. we're going to be watching that. We'll, we, we, we will be watching that. Okay. Let me get someone else who hasn't had a question yet. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly, maybe you can tell me, but the six residences in Evergreen who are currently have the wells who are being forced to go into the city, some against their will, by uh, Paul's negligence. So Paul is paying for the hookup for the water only. They're not paying for the excavation costs. They're not paying for the hookup to the sewer, which is required from what I understand. And, and they're not paying for the difference in the increase in taxes. So what kind of deal is that? Yeah. Sounds like Paul's got us by the ball. Well, it's a lead. That's a lead. Did everybody hear that? Yes. Or do we need to repeat? The question is for the six homes that are currently on wells in the Evergreen subdivision area that are going to be required to hook to the to the city to the city water supply. There, actually, there's an agreement in place. Eventually, those homes we're going, at some point, going to become part of the city. My understanding is if their well or septic fails, then they'd be required to hook up to the city. This is happening, obviously, much sooner than that. And, and the company, according to state law, is required to provide them with alternate water. The, the state law does not address the requirement to make up the difference that you mentioned about increased taxes and paying a water bill and hooking up to the sewer. And that is a matter that can be uh, handled in, in court by the, by the private parties who are impacted by that. It doesn't and, work for any of the rest of and, the it, And uh, my understanding is when that was done a number of years ago that there was a, a, a ruling against yeah, so if, the yeah, private parties. Screw but, again. but follow up, a follow up to that is, did the local governments, the Sire Township and our city governments, help the people, their own citizens, no. to organize to have a class action suit to get right. their costs? Thank you. Oh, no, the city wanted the taxes right. yeah, from the sure. Sire Township and that's, residents. That's right. an issue that, you know, I think we, we should probably move on to other questions because that is not something that DEQ has authority over. You mean you could not have, have Add that to the negotiations right. well, that they pay all the expenses well, that they are causing us. Uh, I suppose that's something we could have, and we did not, um, we did not do that. Yeah, right. And you did not notify at least us six people that we were going to be forced into the city of Ann Arbor. Right. No All this was done in secrecy. Right. Well, it, we did have the public meeting uh, in May of 2009, and I, was there a legal notice? There was a legal notice. There yeah. were articles in the paper. Um, and that Paul's proposal to expand the prohibition zone was discussed then, and I'm sorry um, if you didn't know about it. But the last public output was that it was rejected. And so you go into the secret negotiations for 20, 22 months. And not only is it accepted, it's already codified in the consent judgment. All the other decisions you make at this site, 
You've always had another public meeting when you flip-flop. This time, you went ahead and ignored all of our inputs that we had every month in the card meetings. Didn't give any of this stuff before the judge to let him know it's really happening. And yeah. instead, and we weren't you let the company walk yet. away. Walk away from this cleanup. They don't have to do any more cleanup at this site. That's not true. Well, then we... Well, you watch. You watch what happens. They, gonna, they've got to they've got got you in the rock and like yeah. Again, you know, the provisions of the state law are such that... Um, well, I'm not blaming you personally. I'm, I'm talking to you as agents of the... Yeah, where's okay, your, where's I, your PR I, guy? Well, as I said, I, I understand your frustration and anger. and Because um, what everybody needs to do, I mean, we've talked to our representatives, all the local representatives are with us, I think, most of the legislators here. But we have to talk to people in other parts of the state and say, you know, this is not good. It can happen here where we have concerned citizens, good information, you know, and we're engaged in this. What it's going to be like out in the hinterlands where they don't have the resources we have. This is not good for the state of Michigan, which in turn is not good for 20% of the world's fresh water. I mean, we're, we're stewards of 20% of the world's surface fresh water, and we got the highest, uh, the loosest standards for this. And not only that, if you, if you take it a step further, the 2800 is really what's in effect at this site from Wagner wrote on. It's like the standard is 2800 instead of being five, so it really looks more like this. <laughs> this is what Michigan standards are. They affect these standards of what, what's happened at this site. Does anybody contradict that? Of course not. Because they have good lawyers, they have better lawyers, and we can afford to hire at the state, apparently. Are there any other questions that we can... I just wanted to clarify, did you think earlier Saul Stark has an EPA issue to permit to the the question, the question is, did we say that this all started because EPA issued a permit to Gellman 20, 30 years ago? I'll let Sybil. Uh, no, it was the DNR. DNR. Yes, it was the state. It was a state. So Michigan is, is uh, here. Well, the, the, there wasn't a permit. There was an order of determination that basically had a paragraph that says you cannot harm the waters of the state. That was the original. Well, I thought she said well, there was a permit later well, in 77. I'm, I'm it, using that term loosely, but it was part, it was a regulated activity. It, you know, the, we have a court finding that at least part of the discharge was authorized by the state. Um, and, you know, it, this it goes, brings to mind the question the gentleman over here asked earlier about what, is, uh, what does it mean to be part of the economic development. I mean, you know, I said something, too, about us um, doing a balancing act. And I think the DEQ, the former DNR, the former Department of Conservation, when the Water Resources Commission was issuing um, orders of determination back in the 40s and 50s, this has been a classic uh, thing society has had to consider, and, and that's jobs versus the environment. So um, we're, I mentioned the pendulum swinging back and forth. Do you have your counterparts, do you have folks like you that work for DEQ in the city of Detroit? The question is, do we have DEQ staff, uh, our counterparts that work in the city of Detroit? We've got, uh, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How many parcels are involved in the new prohibition zone? Um, the question is, how many parcels are involved in the new prohibition zone? 400, maybe. I'm not absolutely certain, but it's, you know, it's a goodly number. Um, we can show the... Um, so you've never done a, a 400 mailing, 400 letter mailing to anybody ever to know I have I of anything? I have. I have. I've done one other person. We have, we have, you know, we, we haven't done this site recently. And, um, there's a question. Just the process. Are they going to, in the new prohibition? So will they be going door to door to see if we have wells still existing? I believe they're planning to do it by mail. And they're first, they're going to, again, they're going to look at the homes that were built before water supply was available because, you know, that means that there was a well there. For homes that were built in 1990, 
when they were they were part of the city and had to look up. They don't have to survey those homes. So Paul is going to be doing it. Yes, but they and they submit the information to us, and we. But they may it. or may not be liable for paying for plugging the well. Well, it's our position that they are. That's our position. And again, they have so far they have plugged all of the wells that they have found. If you were me, would you show them where the well is? Yes. What was the question, sir? Yeah, sorry, the question was, if you were me, would you show them where the well is? And I understand there, are, you know, there might be some concerns with that, but there, for one thing, any, if you have a well, it could always be used in the future, and the bloom could migrate, and it could cause an exposure. But the other point is, we have a, a, a well regulation that requires unused wells to be plugged because those are conduits. If you have a, a release at the surface, it can go down into that well and cause more groundwater contamination. So even though it is a res restricted zone, we still don't want to create more of a problem. So there's, there's at least two. Okay, we've got a woman in red here and then a gentleman to my right. Okay, the question is, what's the difference between mass removal and full cleanup? You want to do that? That's my turn. Um, full cleanup is just what we're saying. Uh, they have to clean up to the state cleanup criteria of 85 parts per billion currently. Mass removal, which is uh, what we've got provided for in the, um, in the revised consent judgment, there's no strict uh, standard that they have to comply with when they're done but they have to continue to remove mass, they have to continue to remove dioxane. So what, and then, you know, we had a, a slide that showed up earlier, and you know, Roger had a different one using, ours was 85 parts per billion, Roger's was, was uh, one part per billion. Um, even though that's basically a generalized, you, again, use the well data and the, the concentrations from the wells and extrapolating between the well points, um, even though the edges of it have a trunk, the middle of it used to have concentrations in the tens to, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of parts per billion. Up to 200,000 parts per billion, and for the most part lower. Than now that. we've got a lot less higher concentrations, although there are still a couple hot spots, one with probably 20 or 30,000. There's one 50, very shallow 50, well right. that has, uh, has some high concentrations. But the, the main plume areas are below 10,000 parts per billion. So there has been, that's mass removal. I mean, that has removed a large quantity of, of the mass, dioxane. The mass is the actual dioxane? Yes. yes. So they have, a, they as part of the five-year plan, which we didn't get into, uh, they had to do benchmarks, and Roger had mentioned, that they calculated how much was down there that they would have to remove in order to achieve a cleanup in five years. And yes, they did remove more mass than they said was down there. In fact, since 2000, I believe they've removed 64,000 pounds of dioxane from the groundwater. And that has been mostly destroyed and turned into water and carbon dioxide in, in a small, uh, low concentration currently seven parts per billion monthly average is being discharged to the Honey Creek tributary. So how much is question left? over here and then yeah. this gentleman over here. So there's some continuity in this discussion. How much is left what? to be cleaned up? Less how much than there mass is left. How much mass, mass is left to be cleaned up? That's what we've been that. asking for. No, they're, yeah. they're on, on a performance based remedy right now. We're on the West Side of Wagon Road. Boom shin shall not expand from its current extent. And on the east side, they can't exceed 2,800 at Maple Road. Um, and we've got the contingencies available in the north part of the, the prohibition zone. Sir? Uh, first, I'd like to follow up your comment, too, about the uh, maps that they have removed. Is that on target with what they projected, greater or less than what they projected? They, as Roger had Repeat said, question, yes, yes, the question was, did they remove more mass or less mass than they predicted? And they actually found more mass than they predicted was down there. I didn't ask what I'm sorry. I'd say how much did they removed. They removed more than they said was there originally. That's what I want to know. The second question is, I noticed that there are areas above the 85 parts per billion that are 
excluded from the prohibition zone. Can you explain why that is? On the west side of Wagner Road. The west, north. Yeah, well, the west, because everything to the east of Wagner is covered by the prohibition zone. And to the west, they are going to rely on deed restrictions because there are fewer parcels, and they will deal directly with those property owners, which we believe is a more equitable way to uh, to, to put that kind of restriction on, as opposed to a court order prohibition zone. But our statute, when you have such a large number of parcels, it does allow for this, what we call a, an institutional control. I'd like to follow up that. As a practical matter, somebody outside the prohibition zone above 85 parts per million cannot go well, legally. Uh, well, uh, the comment is, as a practical matter, somebody, somebody outside the prohibition zone who has a well, or no, excuse me, who's located has property in an area with concentrations greater than 85 can't legally drill a well. Mike, is that, that's probably the case, right? The county wouldn't permit me. Yeah. Right. So, what happens when those people are part of a percentage group? Well, in terms of uh, future development you're talking about? Or you're sinking a well, replacing a well? That is uh, definitely an obstacle. For, for use of groundwater for any other purpose, but those, that area is hooked up to city water. So, so they do have an alternate drinking water supply. Some, some people don't. Um, not above 80, I guess I would need to know more specifics. I'm not aware of that area. There are some drinking areas that we've talked about in the past. Well, I don't know if you want to talk about it afterwards. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, there's a gentleman over here. Yes. You know, it would be simple mathematics to determine how much was leaked in the first place from 1961 to 1986, so, assuming that no further leaking has taken place. So the amount that has been extracted versus what was injected, do you see any hope that uh, this, even if it's expanded, proves the amount would be not as much? Do you get, uh, you see what I'm I think I think the comment is using mass balances. If we knew the starting point, how much dioxane Gelman um, originally put into the ground, how much they've taken out, we should be able to know how much is left, and therefore make some kind of assessment of how long, if ever, it would take to achieve uh, what? Uh, 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 extraction to three parts per billion. No. Well. In theory, it's possible, yet we don't know how much they started with. And there might, be, there might be, and maybe Roger knows this, but, but the other consideration is that when they were using the dioxane for the first, for the 20 years, a significant amount of that went into surface water. It didn't all leach into the groundwater. Some of it went into Third Sister Lake when they were doing spray irrigation. Some of it went overflowed from the lagoon into the marshy area, which then went into the Honey Creek tributary and down to the Huron and then to Erie. Um, so, so, I don't know. I, I have no idea what the ratio of that would have been. Okay, question in the back. There's a partial answer to the question about the mass, the total mass that might be there. The company purchased 800,000 pounds of dioxane during its tenure. Um, we don't know, as Sybil said, where all of it ended up. However, in the first uh, permit that was proposed for uh, discharging treated groundwater to the Honey Creek tributary, there was a requirement that the company at Van Gelman Sciences had to demonstrate that there was no discharge from the surface waters into local groundwater. They never made that demonstration. So it's entirely possible that they never satisfied that requirement and that permit then was changed to a different permit um, that was so restrictive as to the uh, concentrations of dioxane in the effluent, mainly due to uh, the challenges to the permit that we citizens brought. Um, uh, the, we really don't know how much of the 800,000 pounds went into groundwater or groundwater through surface water. But I think it's safe to say that that's the basic amount we're dealing with. Um, 
We don't know what supplies they had left of that 800,000 pounds when they terminated use at one point that I'm saying. But that's a number that those of us who looked at this through the years have in our minds. The other thing I want to say about... Can I summarize that for people that do? Could you guys hear it prompt or not? Oh, you guys all heard yeah. 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 Thanks, sorry. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I'm very troubled by is a regulatory protocol that doesn't tie mass removal to anything except remove some mass. As you pointed out, the mass that's been removed so far was removed according to a protocol that said they had to uh, achieve uh, 85 parts per billion before that other parts per billion standards or they had to achieve a certain effluent concentration because of the discharge permit, for example, to the tributary, or achieve effluent uh, limitations on their groundwater reinjection permits. So the mass removal was tied to some specific numerical regulatory standards. From what I saw on that chart, there's no regulatory standard that is going to determine what mass they're removing. They aren't really required to do anything in particular. They can say, well, here's the results, we remove some mass. Then how do you, Mitch, how do you, Sybil, say that's enough or that's not enough? Well, I, I, did everybody hear that from? Yeah. Okay. I'll answer it in two parts. One, I think by when you're looking at uh, east of uh, Wagner Road, when the court came up with the, point, the groundwater surface water interface based cleanup criteria that they had, they couldn't exceed at Maple Road, um, that changed things. Uh, so we couldn't, once that was in place, we couldn't require a, a more restrictive level. And recall, that at the time of making the decision, the department advocated for attacking the plume at three places. One was in the vicinity of Maple, one was at the leading edge, one was at Wagner. Okay, so once the court came up with the groundwater surface water interface based criterion for uh, Maple Road area, that changed it. The way we chose the modifications to address the area west of Wagner, absent a specific criteria, uh, a mass removal threshold or uh, numerical um, standard that they had to achieve was by benchmarking what the extent is the 85 west of Wagner Road. They said, you know, the company said their conceptual model was that the contaminated groundwater in the shallower aquifers flows in many directions, north, south, and west of Wagner Road, and as it goes, it seeps down deeper below ground to the deeper aquifer, it resumes a regional <coughs> flow back toward the east. And that was the basis for their um, contention in the papers they filed with the court that the western extent of contamination wouldn't expand. We said in these amendments, okay, we're not, you know, let's benchmark where the extent of the 85 is west of Wagner Road. And if it expands, you've got to A, pull it back, and B, pay a penalty. And that was one of the, that, you know, and those were some of the concerns that we had and got embodied in the consent judgment. When you say pull it back, um, <coughs> that was up on one of the charts. Yeah. That area. Um, I mean, it might, might be for others. What does that entail? Well, it's how can well, they pull the it question back? is how do you pull it back? They're going to have to pump, pump a higher volume, or perhaps at a greater number of points, and we viewed that as a strong disincentive for them to prematurely stop removing mass west of Wagner Road because we had the performance standard that the 85 extent shouldn't expand, and if it did, that they'd have to increase their mass removal, essentially mass removal, but pumping and et cetera. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing that I wonder about is the connection between the 2,800 parts per billion from the surface water interface allowable migration uh, to the river and these requirements 
requirements that 85 parts per billion or, or thereabouts can enter the PZ. Now, my assumption is that 2,800 parts per billion can enter the PZ. What's, where does the 85 parts per billion come from? And I can't remember which chart it was up there that had, uh, can you find that symbol? That, uh, that the 85 parts per billion can enter the PZ, the, the comparative chart before. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I haven't got that up yet because um, the doctor is using the other screen. Uh, I think, I think, I'm not sure what the question is that here. I mean, certainly on the north side and south side of the prohibition zone, the 85 generic residential cleanup criteria is the driver and point of compliance. To protect the water sources, the northwest supply level and the marsh lines. Yes. On the north and south. Yes. So in the middle, where I live, yes. we can have 2,800 parts per billion. As long as you're under 2,800. As long as you are uh, west of the neighbor road. My neighbors love hearing that. Yes. But again, we're not. They're going to keep purging at Wagner and Maple to reduce the mass and the concentration. And so far, we haven't seen anything uh, really much beyond Veterans Park, uh, much higher than a hundred, a few hundred parts per billion. I'm also really uncomfortable um, on behalf of my neighborhood and all of us that we used to. Road, and I guess everybody in this whole thing is with establishing reliable performance monitoring on this site because of the thing that you talked about um, out in the Little Lakes area, the purge well comes Sorry. up with more concentration than any of the wells around it. This is a glacial outwash, as we know, and there aren't any stratified layers of, of uh, of formations in soils, in rocks, in aquifers, that sort of thing. And I know that the argument that the company has made is that, well, it's all one thing, so let's just go at it as, as though it's all one thing, because we can't really find all of the detail. We can't ever know exactly what communicates with what and where. Well, I think but that, the know, obverse of that is that monitoring is pretty is very difficult to establish at a level of reliability that the folks in this room and the people in this community can have confidence in. This stuff does surprise us and turns up in different places. I have neighbors that moved out uh, Maple Road uh, out of our neighborhood because they thought, well, it's farther away. But of course, they're concerned now that that things could be coming into their new residences. They bought this for 10 or 15 years here, and now they're out there. So I know you can't say, uh, be assured that this is reliable, but I think everybody should know how vigilant the community really needs to be um, and, and how many questions we need to be asking. And we need to be talking to folks as much as the company does. Because that's not that you short shrift us on attention. You've given us great attention for the years. But with the deterioration in our regulatory framework in this state, uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, to the point that uh, we aren't the vanguard, Roger, for deterioration of standards in the state. We're just joining the rest of the state now. We've had we've had more insistence on more rigorous cleanup in this community because of the huge interest in this community in it. The rest of the states pretty much monitored migration of contaminants and attempts to keep them from actually uh, being exposed to human beings. That's the state of our natural resources. Yeah,